from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. Welcome to Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music. On this episode, we explore how to embed SEL in the Jazz Ensemble classroom. We welcome Director of Jazz and Bands at Pentucket Regional High School in West Newbury, Massachusetts, David Schumacher. And now, our host of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, Scott Edgar. Hi, I'm Scott Edgar. Welcome to the next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. It is my honor today to explore an area that we haven't explored yet, and that's the intersections between social and emotional learning and jazz in the music classroom. I first met today's guest when he was doing a session for a NAFME webinar looking at jazz education and social and emotional learning, and I said, we have to have him on the show. David, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. It's a privilege. Can you talk to us a little bit about your journey to where you are now? When I heard you speak as part of the NAFME webinar, I was like, oh my goodness, rock star. I can't believe I haven't met him yet. Uh, sure. My journey began in the 2019-20 school year. Our district was focusing on social emotional learning in our PD for that year. And so I was engaged in that process. And then we had Erin Moore, who presented to us from the Center for Responsive Schools, and she discussed uh, choice, student choice, and how it feeds SEL. And that, for whatever reason, really clicked with me, and it got me diving deeper into this concept and really thinking about some heady questions, you know, such as how can my students' passion for music help others or even themselves? Do they understand the power of the music that they're playing and learning to heal and inspire and strengthen community? And do they understand that it's got an impact on their personal well-being and uh, the ability to change our society? You know, what does lifelong learning actually mean to me and my students? And the big question, the one that really got to me was, you know, what do I want music education to be? And so taking that question and starting to chew on it, is right when COVID hit. And that felt like an obligatory opportunity to really engage my students in that real-time emotional processing that we were all experienced, experiencing in those early months and to show them how music could play a vital role in that process. And living with that for those months and now those years has really changed the way I approach my teaching and the way I approach my students. David, thank you so much for that. And, you know, it's interesting. I was just hearing John Batiste as he was accepting his Grammy for Album of the Year. And he said, sometimes music finds you. You know, you put music out in the world and it has a radar for when you need it. And it seems like SEL had a radar and found you when you, we slash needed it as part of quarantine and the pandemic. It couldn't have been more perfect timing. Absolutely right. It it was, it set me up for that perfect uh, frame of mind to be able to employ all of those great skills with my students right when they needed it most. Absolutely. Now, question, because you said your journey started in 1920 when you had some targeted professional development looking at social and emotional learning. My guess is part of this has been in your DNA the, your entire teaching career. And this was a way to give it a little bit of a construct, maybe some language that you didn't have, or a way to delve deeper. But what are some strings that might have already been there before you received this targeted professional development that just really resonated? Well, I feel like a lot of these elements are inherent to music education, but our job is to recognize and then teach them with purpose. And that's really the key, right? So if you know, we're instinctively finding these threads and instilling these passions and these um, powers of music in our students, it's another thing to do so with purpose and can make those help the students make those connections to SEL for themselves. And it's what we call intentionality. You know, we have, right. and that doesn't mean that we go into the classroom and write SEL on the board. That means that in our role as preparation uh, for our class, we are putting those life skills right on the same plane as the musical skills. Absolutely. And I think even to that point, if we avoid putting SEL on the board, the students will perhaps be even further engaged because they're not realizing that they're being taught a specific 
concept, but we're just taking that holistic approach to music and well-being and personal choice and personal meaning. And they, I think, respond to it in a, in a greater way. It's organic. It's not seen as a box check or something that augments the music. It is the music. I couldn't agree more. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. So, you know, you, you spoke about how when that 1920 school year came about and you had this professional development opportunity, that it really kind of provided a reset for where you were headed. So I think a lot of our teachers right now are exhausted uh, for a lot of different reasons. But one of the biggest reason is that we're trying to figure out the, the what and, and the how of music education. And it feels like we're reinventing it every day. A lot of the things that we're doing right now may not be how we were taught music. But I think that there's one thing that can be a salve for that, and that's recentering around the why of music education. Why do we wake up every day? Why do we go in and prioritize our students? And why did music become our portal to be able to work with students? So can you talk a little bit about that? Why do we teach music? Why do we make music? Why is that an important part of our identity in music education? Absolutely. The why is is definitely the big question. And I think students need to consider that question for themselves to really be completely engaged and invested in the music making process. Uh, students are curious at that age. They want to know why they're doing everything they're doing, and we need to help them make those connections. So for me, it was a big shift towards that why. I might have been thinking about the why internally, but I wasn't necessarily expressing that or bringing that up with the students. And I realized that for me, and I think everyone can relate to this, music is something that we should be giving to others, right? It's not, we can take it from a, a sort of selfish pursuit to a more benevolent one by showing the students that what we are doing is not for our own gain, although there is absolutely some some gain to be had, but it's for others. If we're performing, it's for the audience members. If we're doing a community event, it's for the community. And that shift in mindset, I think, is really powerful and profound for not only us as educators, but as the students, for the students as performers and for young as young artists. So thinking about music as uh, an instrument of good or of change or of healing is a really important distinction. And the example that I like to talk about is from this current school year, back in the fall, uh, Veterans Day, our preparations for our, our typical Community Veterans Day ceremony. I think we can all relate to that time of year and our students are not necessarily completely engaged or connected to that music, the traditional music that we would perform at a ceremony like that. And I was seeing the same thing that I've seen in years past where the students are, you know, they're not really excited about that music and the preparation involved. And they're not, as a result, putting in uh, the love, the energy, right? In, in the enthusiasm into their performance. And so for me, it was like, okay, what is our goal here, students? Why are we doing this? Why are we preparing this music? Does it matter that it's not your favorite music? Does it matter that most of you don't have a specific connection to this music? And the answer, of course, was no, because this performance wasn't going to be for us or about us in any way. It was to honor the veterans, people for whom this music carried tremendous value and significance, right? This was going to be our gift to them and our support for them and our honoring of them and the sacrifices they made. So whether our students enjoyed the music was irrelevant. Our job in that moment as musicians was to make that empathetic connection to the veterans and their music and to be able to share that with them and our community at the same time. And that really is what I wanted to instill in my students was the power of music and the power of empathy in the process. David, so powerful because I think oftentimes when we talk about being culturally responsive or culturally relevant, it's from that perspective of the student. And I do believe we need to meet the students often where they are so we can bring them on a journey. But I love the shift of saying, you know, music is a gift that we give because I think oftentimes whether we're locking ourselves in a practice room or whether we're working for 60 rehearsals for one concert, we're, we're focused on 
us? How can we get the music where it needs to be? And that reframe is really a powerful one to explore. And, and, and I appreciate that music as a gift. I think that's probably one of the pieces that made the last two years really, really difficult is that we couldn't share music in a way that we were used to sharing it. And whether we knew it or not, the concert, we like the accolades, sure, but it is about seeing the audience respond to the gift that we're giving them. Right. And as any performer will tell you, it's a two-way street when you're performing, right? It's the energy that you're you're feeling from the audience as well as the energy that you're giving back to the audience. And so without that connection, you're absolutely right. It is more difficult. So how, how did your students respond? You know, because I'm guessing that in, in the end that you did this really, really valuable uh, experience where the students were giving the gift of this Veterans Day concert uh, to people who the music was relevant to. Were there some students who still said, nah, not, not it, I'm glad to see that it reached them, but that's not for me? Or did we see a, a group come together and say, yes, this is our new mission, this is our new why? I'm happy to say that it was the latter and it was right away. Uh, I took, you know, five or 10 minutes at the beginning of this rehearsal to have this conversation with them. And I noticed a difference immediately. The remainder of that rehearsal was far more productive and focused. And we went on to learn that music or for the upperclassmen, relearn that music at a much higher level than we had ever learned it in the past. And I really felt like there was love in that music as we rehearsed it and as we uh, prepared it. And I'm also happy to say that after our performance, the community leader who ran that event took the time to write us a note and tell us that he noticed that the students were more focused. He noticed that they were there on another level than they had been in the past and that the music they performed was, you know, as, as good as he could remember it being. And that really was a great feeling for me. And I shared that with the students and I could see them, I think, start to make those connections for themselves. Like, oh, wait a minute. Okay. So we have just done a good thing for others. And not only did we make them feel good, but that kind of feels good ourselves as well. And that was an important connection for them. David, you bring up a really, really um, thoughtful point there, because I think oftentimes music teachers think either it's making this SEL connection and exploring that side of things or musical excellence, that it really is this dichotomy that, oh, I'm giving up rehearsal time to focus on this, that the music's going to get worse. And I think you really eloquently just said that it's not an either or. It's definitely not. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think the the focus on that component, the SEL component, feeds the preparation and performance of that music to make it stronger. And it does so in a very efficient way. And another good example of that is students with, you know, performance anxiety at any to any degree, when because we, we all know as uh, human beings, when we are focused on others in an empathetic way, it takes us out of our own head, right? And it removes anxiety because we are focused on someone else. So for those with performance anxiety, if they're framing, as you said so nicely, that performance as giving to someone else, it removes, I think, some of that pressure and some of that anxiety as performers because they're not wrapped up in, oh, I, I need to play this perfectly or I, I, I. It's about giving, and that that sort of stepping out of one's head gives them uh, a level of confidence and a level of, of dedication that really leads to some excellent performances. And, and I, I love that you just used plural there, because that's where I was going to go. So have you seen this after? Did this one experience with the Veterans Day concert, has it continued? Have, we, have you seen those trends go beyond that one event? Yes, although I, I will admit that that one event has been the big one because I think that was a, a grand opportunity for the students to make those connections in such an obvious way. It, it happens uh, on our subsequent performances to a smaller degree, but I think definitely in performance, showing them that it is something we're giving to the audience kept them in the moment more than they would have been otherwise. And of course, that mindfulness leads to, you know, a better performance and better engagement. So I think where I saw it was 
not only in that focus during the performance, but after the performance and the students feeling like, oh, I really felt connected to the audience, or I really felt connected to the music, or I really felt like my section was more cohesive than usual. And so in those little ways that compile to make a larger experience, I think we were able to continue throughout the rest of the concert season. And that cohesiveness is is so critical to everything that we do in music education because it just requires so much vulnerability. We have to put ourselves out there constantly. Our strengths are literally on stage, as are our weaknesses. So can you talk a little bit about how you get at that second bucket of SEO, this idea of belonging? How can we come together and truly have this community? How do you explicitly start, maybe from the very beginning, think about, you know, back in 2019, to create that trust and community in your classroom? Well, I think the why question is a big part of that that we were discussing earlier. I think getting the students engaged more in the process, why they're doing what they're doing, how it's going to impact others or their own personal well-being and making those connections uh, gets them engaged at that level for sure. And have you experienced any moments when maybe that sense of community wasn't there? And how did you respond to that? Any students, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm sure our guests are saying, when are they going to start talking about jazz? And, and, and we'll, we'll get there in a second. But we, we do know that the creative output from jazz sometimes requires even increased vulnerability. So maybe some of those students aren't feeling as comfortable as part of the community. Absolutely. I think that's the case. But the, the community, the use of that word is, is really a beautiful word because we are a community as an ensemble and we are a part of a community as a performing ensemble. Right. And so there's community at several different levels. And I think the way I was able to re-engage my students to that sense of community was within the actual rehearsal time and saying, making connections for them, you know, trumpets, who else has the melody? Very simple things that we all do on a regular basis, but again, doing so with purpose. So getting the students to listen through their section, listen across the ensemble, and giving them more and more responsibility in our preparation and our performance, and removing some of that from me as the conductor, I think that really got them thinking about community and how their piece fit into that community piece uh, to a level that led, again, to greater performance and greater investment in the process. Well, you trusted them, right? You, you said, I, I trust you musically. I trust you to show up. What did, what are some tangible ways, you know, I'm thinking of a young teacher, you know, a first year teacher who's going out and it's like, oh, I, I, I have to be in control. I have to have my fingers in the dough all the time. Uh, it takes a leap of faith to do exactly what you said. Can you talk a little bit about that? It does, and it's something that I've been learning as I've, as I've been teaching, uh, and, and more so since I started investing in this SEL concept within the classroom. The trust is crucial both directions. So if our students are trusting us, they're gonna remain engaged, they're gonna try new things, they're gonna step out of their comfort zone, and if we are trusting the students, we're actually going to find out more about them and allow them to find their own voice in a more effective and efficient way. So um, that trust, I think, is difficult, as you were saying, for teachers, uh, but it's one that is crucial on so many different levels. And I think we will all be surprised by what our students can accomplish if we give them some autonomy over what they're learning, how they're learning it, and again, turning to the why they're learning in the first place. So that trust is a huge piece. And uh, I think we're gonna you know, talk about some of my work with my students and trust plays a big role because in giving them so much choice, um, you know, you, 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 can, you can wind up in some places you did not expect, and sometimes those places are the best places because you're seeing a different side of a student or you're seeing a different thread that you haven't seen that student present, and, you know, you walk away with a stronger sense of community, not only between you and that student, but between that student and their peers as well because we're seeing things that we don't normally see in our day-to-day -day environment. Well, we don't see them because it's typically a one-way arrow from the podium 
out as opposed right. to the world that we're talking about. So let, let's go there, David. Give us okay. some examples of what this looks like in your classroom. Sure. So the pandemic and that emotional processing that we were talking about was really eye-opening for me. My students, um, for the most part, live very comfortable lives, and they don't have uh, some of the same perspectives that we would find with uh, urban students or students in, in other demographics. And so when I was seeing their responses to the pandemic early on, I noticed that they were very self-centered responses. Everything they said had started with the word I. And I felt like that was really leading them astray from what we were all going through as a community, both small and large. And so I wanted to teach them about empathy. And so we had several discussions about empathy and we rolled those discussions into a large project that I called the Empathy Project. And this was um, a project in which students sought out a family member or a community member who they saw struggling in some way with the isolation of the pandemic in those early months. And their job was to make a connection, a personal connection through music with that person. And we laid out a whole bunch of different options and we worked on this list collectively, but it had options such as, you know, pre-recording a performance and sharing it with that person. It could have been playing over some sort of Zoom type application live for that person. It could be sharing uh, recordings with that person, having um, a connection to both the, the music that the student really enjoyed or the music that the person receiving that attention really enjoyed. And more importantly than any of that was to have communication as part of the process. So yeah, sure, you know, Aunt Jane loves to hear me play. That's great, it was nice for her, but let's discuss that performance and let's discuss how she's doing and how that performance made her feel. And that is really where we started to make those empathetic connections. And so again, the concept of empathy helps us get out of our head, relieves anxiety, rumination, isolation, all of the things that many of us were feeling during the pandemic. and when we feel those things, we tend to shut down. And it seems like empathy is inertia's natural antidote. It gets us moving and it gets us engaged or re-engaged. And so some of the results I saw from this project were really, truly astounding. There were students who did what you would consider somewhat predictable, performing and sharing recordings, but there were some unique projects. I had a student who uh, performed Anchors Away for her cousin who was about to go uh, on deployment with the Navy. I had a student who recognized his father who was still going to work during these early months who really loved the Three Stooges and could tell that his father needed a distraction and needed to relieve some anxiety about going to work. And so the student surprised him at work with some Three Stooges uh, musical recordings that reminded him of his favorite episodes, and they had a, a really nice laugh about that. And then my favorite was a student who had unfortunately just lost his father the previous school year, and he decided to sit down with his mother and listen to some of his dad's favorite music together. And I want to read, if I could, uh, an excerpt from his reflection after the project. I should say that part of this project uh, at its conclusion was every student needed to write up a reflection on their um, their uh, part in this project and their experience. And so the student says, my mother has gone through a lot in her life and says that this song gives her a sense of hope. This type of music calms her and makes her feel content and relaxed. It also reminds her of someone she and I loved dearly. Overall, I just love to have these nice, calm, warm felt nights where it is just me, my mom, and my dog together being a happy family. And that is just such a profound response from a student who usually keeps very much to himself. But I learned more about the student in that reflection than I had learned in the previous three years working together with that student. So it was, it was really eye-opening and so much so that I decided to repeat this project a few weeks later um, to get those students engaged at an even higher level. 
David, the story, the example, setting the stage for that. I have so many thoughts going right now, but I think I, I, I want to pause for one second. Can you define empathy for us? Because I think that's one of those buzzwords that just, uh, it, it surrounds us all. And I think that so much of what you did speaks for itself. But for a student who may not understand what empathy is, how would you explain it to them? So how I explained it to my students was that empathy is turning your thoughts, your energies towards someone else and trying to understand what another person is going through. So with regard to the pandemic, it was pretty straightforward. Everyone is, is reacting and experiencing the pandemic in a unique way. So find someone and put yourself in that person's shoes. What are they feeling? What are they experiencing? What do they need for support? And then trying to make that connection and offer them the support through music in this case. So empathy is really letting go of yourself and coming at an experience through someone else's eyes, someone else's perspective. Perfect. Thank you. And I love that you included the element of reflection. One of my favorite quotes is from John Dewey that says, we don't learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. So just walking through and saying, you know, I'm going to do this SEL thing and the students are going to magically become more self-aware or socially aware. No, that reflection piece is the connectivity. It's how do I connect to this? Can you give us a few other examples of maybe how you encourage your students to reflect in your classroom? Well, I use reflection frequently. So we always do a post-performance reflection where the students will discuss um, not only the technical aspects. So what did I do well? What did my section do well? What did our ensemble do well? What were some of our challenges? What do we need to do for next time? What are the goals we should set? Those kinds of standard things. Uh, we always do a, perf uh, a uh, reflection after a festival or a competition to talk about what we heard in some of the other groups and relate that to what we're doing and how we could uh, improve our own studies. So again, it's, it's for the students, like you said, that connectivity piece, it's great to engage in an activity, but it's really the thinking through that experience where you cement those uh, perspectives and you cement those connections that help you then do it again the next time on your own, perhaps without your teacher, you know, asking you to do so. So it's really part of that independent learning and that intrinsic motivation piece that we're really trying to instill in our students. And, and that's it. You know, so many folks right now are just saying, so just tell me what the goal of SEL is. And one of the best answers that I've ever heard is we want the students to be independent. We want them to be independent learners, independent human beings. I want to make myself irrelevant as the teacher. That means that I've done my job and that the baby birds are flying. Right. And I do a lot of that and I'm doing more so, again, as I become a more experienced teacher. When I'm standing in front of my concert band ensemble, I treat them not so dissimilarly from how I would treat my jazz ensemble. So we're doing a lot this semester on independence of tempo and pulse. We're doing a lot with establishing an internal sense of pulse and listening across the ensemble to lock up whatever we're playing rhythmically. And so we're doing a lot of work where I'm not doing anything. I'll count them in. There we are. Now let's play the next 16 bars or 32 bars or perhaps even an entire piece and let's stay together without me. Let's do all the dynamics without me. Let's make all of those musical decisions without me and let's see how we do. And then we'll go back and again, reflect in an immediate way. Where did we struggle? What did we do well? How can we improve? And then we'll do it again. And that that process, I've seen pretty drastic results, positive results in my students uh, this year with a big focus on, on that responsibility piece. Again, as a performer, well, let me, let me back up a second. When we're talking about jazz, we often talk about the rhythm section as being responsible for the time in some way. And I've been talking to them both in jazz and in concert band that Everyone is responsible for the time. It's not one person or one section. It's everyone's responsibility. And so, again, putting that responsibility on them engages them. 
on another level. If I'm just standing there telling them what to do, they can kind of tune out a little bit. But if it's their responsibility, then they're engaged at a higher level. And if they're engaged at a higher level, our performance will be at a higher level. And that's really important for them. What's interesting is I could see some of our listeners uh, look hearing this conversation and say, well, this just sounds like great music teaching. You know, how, how do we put this on our ensemble to have pulse control? Absolutely. But the flip side of this is through the reflection and through the intentionality of saying there are some other elements at play. This idea of responsibility, this uh, idea of recognizing my own strengths and needs, uh, it brings that SEL layer in and it just deepens everything. It does. And as the conductor, it's very important in this process to not feed the answers to these questions to your students. When we ask the students, what did we struggle with? You want to stand there as a director, silent, until you get some response from those students. Don't give them three seconds and then give them the response that you wanted them to say. Really give them to the time to think about it, to process, and the opportunity to try and respond in, in a way that suits the, the context. And so, again, trusting, as we talked about before, trusting your students to get to these uh, reflective answers, they can and will do it if given the opportunity. It might take them a few tries, but they will get there. And because we're asking the students to articulate what happened, how it happened, why it happened, how we can improve, what do we need to do next time, that is instilling that independent independence uh, that we could never do as conductors otherwise because now they are looking for those answers and they are looking for those moments. And so they are listening at a much deeper level than they were before. And that, of course, is the hallmark of a, of a truly great musician, the ability to listen. And that frees us to do so many other things from the podium and, and to facilitate more than direct. A previous guest on this series was composer Jody Blackshaw out of Australia, just a wonderful human being. And she calls it uh, being a fix-it duck. You know, it's, it's this book that when, whenever this duck tries to fix something, makes it worse. And I think oftentimes we relegate ourselves, we limit ourselves as music teachers to fixers. Uh, how do I fix notes? How do I fix rhythms? And this approach that we're talking about absolutely jettisons that in a way that puts the students at the center. It does. And honestly, we can't fix those things. It's up to the students to fix those things with the tools that we provide them. So again, if we are hammering away at that one measure that's not working, we're only going to get so far. If we give the students the tools, how are you going to practice this section? how are you going to apply the things that you've learned to better this section? Then they'll be able to go on their own and make that happen more effectively than we could. Give a person a fish, teach a person to fish. Exactly. Absolutely. So we started to get there, and I know our audience is saying, jazz, 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 that's how you sold this <laughs> one, Scott. Absolutely. So David, if we can focus specifically on that jazz ensemble, and you mentioned that you have approached your concert band more with that jazz mindset. So what are some unique elements within that jazz ensemble that you have found to be maybe particularly conducive for this work in SEO? Sure. Well, I think in jazz, we, or at least we approach jazz as a more independent music in the first place than we would concert band or orchestra or choir. And so the students and the directors are already more in that frame of mind than they would be otherwise. And so, again, finding those opportunities and teaching and making those connections with purpose is really where we want to focus. So in jazz, obviously, there's improvisation, and improvisation involves uh, you know, really putting yourself out there as a student. It involves confidence. It involves vulnerability. It involves emotion, and it involves a level of processing spontaneously in the moment that we don't necessarily see in other musics. And so we are immediately tapping in to the personality of the student who is learning jazz and performing jazz. And so there's tremendous opportunity there for students to express themselves to a greater and more immediate degree than they would in other ensembles. And so recognizing that as step one and then fostering that as step two is really the important thing. So again, engaging the students through choice, through independence of learning and independence of performing is crucial. Uh, 
for my own program, I, I do have three ensembles at the high school level and the top of those groups, which is an audition only group, we don't have music. I don't give them music at any point in the year. So we do all of our learning through transcription. So again, getting those students engaged at that greater level makes them uh, more independent learners, helps them to be more independent learners, and it helps them to be more connected to the music as well. Because if they're having to transcribe, they're obviously having to listen. And if they're having to listen, they're having to research and they're having to explore perhaps other time periods, other you know nationalities, other everything in order to make that happen. And so we're engaging them in a more worldly way uh, automatically in, the, in that process. I, I think every single jazz band director right now is just drooling, thinking about that top ensemble, working off of transcriptions. Absolutely. So of those three groups, maybe let's go back to the beginning, that group, that, uh, the, that entry level group into jazz. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that I find just in working with teachers is the uncomfortability of teaching improvisation. It's like, I just don't know how to teach improvisation. And sure, there's a theoretical element. Sure, there's a, a modeling element there. But maybe you can give us just a few ideas on teaching improvisation, nuts and bolts, but maybe infused with a solid dose of SEL. Absolutely. So again, it comes down to trust. So the students need to trust in the process. They need to trust in the environment, right? If they're not comfortable in the classroom, they're not going to be comfortable expressing themselves at the level required to be an effective improviser. So that's a huge part, setting the tone that there is no mistake you can make right now, right? And especially in those early stages of learning improvisation, I always focus on giving the students options that are essentially foolproof. We're going to use this scale. Every note of this scale sounds great. You cannot do wrong. Uh, anything that comes out of your instrument is correct, it's good, it's you, it's important, it's of value. So getting them to trust that process is a huge part of it. Um, I, I introduce students to improvisation as early as fourth grade because I do have the luxury of teaching the, being a teacher in the instrumental program at the elementary level and teaching the middle school jazz band and doing the high school program. So. They're learning about improvisation and starting to take those baby steps at an early age. And that's really important to the process too, I think, just to, to make it part of their normal routine learning music. Improvisation is not some mystical thing that we're going to learn when we're older. It's just a part of playing an instrument. Every time you play something that's not written on the page, you have improvised. And that's in a really an important exploratory piece of their, of their studies. And so getting back to the, the pedagogy, once we've got that safe environment established and we've given the students options that they can trust, then it becomes much easier to get them to engage and to get them to put themselves out there emotionally. And talking about improvisation as a story and relating it to, you know, you're at the bus stop, you're hanging out with your friend, you're telling them about what you did this weekend. That's what we're doing when we improvise. And here are the different colors and different textures and different adjectives that we might use, the different flavors as an improviser to help you tell that story. And if you put it into that familiar context, I think the students can relate to it in a way that allows them, again, to engage in the process rather than being intimidated by the process. And that's usually, in my experience, the biggest barrier to teaching students to improvise is that intimidation factor. Oh, it's scary. I don't know. What if I make a mistake? I don't know what to play. Of course not. But that is the process. And if we remove the mistakes and we remove the danger, then they can realize that it's, oh, it's not scary at all. In fact, I can just be myself and I can express myself. This is great fun. And then you get, they're hooked at that point. Oh, great fun. You know, I think oftentimes we forget that this should be an enjoyable venture that we're on. You know, one of my mantras that many people have heard me say is this idea of needs before notes. And I think oftentimes like, well, when do you teach them the scales? When do you teach them, Dorian? When do you teach them all, all the chords? We'll get there. But if they don't feel safe, <laughs> if they don't have that safety, they don't feel comfortable, if they don't even start to see themselves as an improviser, in their identity, 
an encyclopedic knowledge of scales and chords means nothing. Correct. And it's very easy to overwhelm students at that age if you give them too much of that. I think of that piece of the process as exponential. So we want to give them very little at the beginning of the process. And once they're hooked and once they're understanding, they're going to get to a point where you can start throwing all sorts of new options at them. And they will receive those options and process those options very effectively. But in the early stages, you're going to overwhelm them too easily. Absolutely. So David, I have one final question and then we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. But is there, so you mentioned the Veterans Day project. Is there a piece in jazz band? Because I do believe that a lot of social and emotional learning is process-based, but oftentimes we need music as an entry point. Is there a piece, maybe at each level, maybe a piece for you know your beginning group, your middle group, and, and your upper level group that you have found was particularly conducive to explore some of these SEL themes through? Mm, a particular piece. I'm not sure if I have a specific piece in mind, but certainly in the jazz context, focusing on the diversity that's inherent to that music. It is a it is an American music. It is an African-American music. And tying our studies into that reality, and again, trying to find an empathetic connection to the history of that music and trying to find the perspective needed to integrate yourself into that history of jazz music, I think is really the big piece. And from there, I think from your individual student's perspective, finding a work that they can connect with. Uh, I've certainly done lots of pieces. We, we, let me, I'll bring this, this project up. We did a, an underground railroad um, cross-curricular project several years ago where we involved the history department, the English department, the music department, and we did some film and we did some interviews and we did music that went along with that. And we did pieces that were very heavy, um, but connected to that, to that project. And we did, um, a Nina Simone tune called four women. And we did the Billie Holiday piece, strange fruit, and we did other pieces that helped the students form that connection and reinforce that empathetic uh, perspective on the music and the experience of that time period. Music was the portal, right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you, you could have come in and you know, I love the cross curricular. We could have come in and just, you know, brought in a guest speaker, elect, but no, there was an experiential portal where the concert, the music, the experience of creation, the process of that was so powerful. Right. And, and we think about music, you know, we talk about music in film all the time, and we talk about how music connects you to the film and the emotions of the film. Uh, it, it is our portal. I think that's a great way to put it. We can experience, you know, essentially anything in life through music. It is our natural portal. And so, again, recognizing that, and doing so with purpose, I think, is a really helpful thing for our students. It's our soundtrack, right? It's our soundtrack. Right. You know, exactly. we, we all have a soundtrack. And, and you know, I think part of our job as music educators is to expand the soundtrack of our students' lives. Right. So, David, what an honor. You know, obviously, when I heard you speak on that webinar, I was like, this is going to be fantastic. Blew it out of the water. Thank you so much. Send us off with some final thoughts, please. Sure. So... As someone who has really embraced this concept more recently in my teaching career, you don't want to feel burdened by it. You don't want to feel like it's a collection of assignments or adaptations to your curriculum. It's really a mindset more than anything. And if you are able to stay in that moment with your students and recognize those moments as they occur and engage your students in that moment, everyone will benefit because it is, again, something that the students are experiencing in that moment. It's not something that you're giving them to experience later at home. So that moment is powerful and that mindfulness is really the key to delivering effective SEL to your students. 
SEL is a mindset instead of one more thing on the plate. I love exactly. it. David, thank you so much for the gift of your time, the gift of what you brought to this series from the bottom of my heart and from all the listeners and viewers. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you day. so much, Scott. It's been a, been a pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Be well. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to David Schumacher for sharing the stories of his classroom about how social and emotional learning find, found him when he needed it the most through this idea that our students can be active contributors and not just participants in our classrooms, and that we need to trust them to lead forward. It's this way that social and emotional learning and music education become embedded. For Music For All, I'm Scott Edgar. Thank you and be well. From Music For All and our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America, Thank you for joining us for this episode of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music. Yamaha is your partner in music education, not just through instruments and professional audio, but also through teacher resources and support. Visit YamahaEducatorSuite.com as your go-to source for your music program needs and professional development. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through music for all. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environment. We are extremely grateful for any donations gifted to our nonprofit organization. If you enjoyed this episode of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, and in order for us to continue providing our free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider giving to Music for All in any amount at musicforall.org backslash give.